very eyes. Bygones Part 1, Escalade, tickets on television, the John Bull printing outfit and Diggy Valentine. Bygone number one, Escalado, Escalado. Escalado was a popular children's game during the 1950s. Incidentally, children in the 1950s looked and sounded like this. We're having a fabulous party and everything's cracker. Cracker, yes. I mean, never gets interfered with in the restaurants and sort of away by our parents. Because it's the 1950s yes. and they haven't heard of child abuse yet. <laughs> Escalado consisted of a long green strip of plastic turf G-clamped to the dining room table with a handle and ratchet at one end which transmitted vibrations through the turf to six gaily coloured lead horses. <laughs> Premise number one. Lead was once used in children's toys. Premise number two. Children like to put toys in their mouths. Premise number three. The ingestion of lead destroys brain cells. Conclusion. Twenty years later, these children grow up... Into Terry and June's crack team of scriptwriters. A major design error led to the decline of the Escalado. Horses would often gallop backwards, sideways, or in any direction other than towards the winning post. Sometimes they would all topple over and cross the finishing line on their sides, the whole scenario resembling a knacker's yard during an earthquake. <laughs> Bygone number two. Bigots appearing on television. Bigots appearing on television. In the 1950s, when the IBA watchdog was a mere puppy gumming on a teasing ring, and the only qualification required to become a TV producer was a CSE in domestic science, all manner of bigots were allowed access to the airwaves. People in trouble. This program, People in Trouble, was first transmitted on Rediffusion Television in the 1950s. Number one, Mr. Wentworth Day, MP's views on the black man. The black man has a different set of standards, values, morals and principles. In many cases, their grandfathers were eating each other. Well, the lion doesn't change his spots in all that time. Number two, Mr. Wentworth Day, MP's views on the black man again. If a black man makes a lot of money, what do you find? Again, a lack of taste. He's flashy. He's very often arrogant. Number three, Mr. Wentworth Day MP's further views on black men. Are you implying that a half-caste is in any way mentally deficient? Definitely. Number four, Mr. Wentworth Day MP's views on the possibility of his own daughter marrying a black man. I should ask her if she wanted to wake up in the morning and see a coffee-coloured little imp on the uh, pillow beside her calling her mummy. If she did marry him, I should be bitterly disappointed. Mr. Wentworth Day MP died in 1984, and since under British law you cannot libel or slander the dead, we have no hesitation in dubbing him an utter and uncompromising and thankfully now dead bastard. Bygone television logo of the week. Bygone number three. The John Bull Printing Outfit. The John Bull Printing Outfit. The John Bull Printing Outfit was British through and through, with typeface made of pure India rubber. The great leap forward from the potato cut, using methods rejected even by Caxton, it was possible to arrange rubber letters in a slatted plastic plate, so that after three quarters of an hour, you could print your almost illegible name and address over hundreds of sheets of paper, which you would then, quite naturally, throw in the bin. The jingoistic nature of John Bull on the front obviously impressed itself deeply onto the nation's psyche, which is why all neo-fascist British nationalist movements seem to print their literature with it to this day. Bygones Part 2, Clacker, the damn dare interplanetary space communication kit, kittens in beer mugs and Skippy. Oh Bygones number one, Clackers. Clackers. <laughs> A craze with school kids during the long hot mad summer of 1971, clackers were two hardened plastic balls connected together with some very weak string. With dexterous manipulation of the grip, the user could clack his balls together, the source of much linguistic merriment amongst surly prepubescent tight hounds. 
At high velocity, the inevitable consequence was this. Side effects range from the mild, such as blackened nails, bruising of hands, total knee removal, to the severe, frequently leading to general deformity, loss of hair, and the total cessation of life. Bygone number two, the Dan Dare Interplanetary Space Communication Kit. The Dan Dare Interplanetary Space Communication Kit. A thing of great beauty, the Dan Dare Space Communication Kit was no doubt modelled on the very shortwave transmitter Captain Dare used to contact his friends on planets such as Mars, Venus or Tharg or anywhere else they lived around and about the universe. A delight to any four-year-old cognoscenti of interstellar communications, the kit included two-way radio, a Morse clicker with an alphabetical dial which transmitted in the pan-galactic and somewhat jingoistic language of English, notepad for remembering Venusian telephone numbers, and a powerful searchlight to signal manually to your colleagues on Mars. Premise number one. Mars is approximately 50 million miles from the Earth. Premise number two. You would need approximately a 10 million watt transmitter to broadcast speech over this distance. Unfortunately, in Merit, the manufacturers of the Dander Space Communication Kit equipped their sets with a 9 volt battery. Premise number three, the kit was not, strictly speaking, an interstellar voice transmogrification electronic space communication kit at all, more your primitive telephone with only just enough wire to get from the kitchen to the bathroom. Enough, however, to upend Granny as she trundled across the linoleum on her Zimmer frame. Right, Cliffs, I've done over. <laughs> you blimmin' cow, son! <laughs> Bygone television logo of the week. I got number three. Kittens in beer mugs. Kittens in beer mugs. Pick up any copy of Rebellion or Tippets magazines from the 1960s and you would be almost certain to find a cute picture of, say, a duck kissing a kitten, probably in a beer mug, with a tweet caption along the lines of, Ducky is my daddy now. Oh, look. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Oh, isn't it lovely? Oh, 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 oh yeah, now. right. Oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the real world, ducks and cats get on about as well as a dozen armed Shiite Muslim militia gunmen arriving uninvited at a town with Allah Tel Aviv Bar Mitzvah, which is to say, not very well at all. Oh, oh, in this case, what the oh, doting and gumming oh, OAP audience had failed oh, to realise oh, was that Bill of the State of Higgins came from a long line of abattoir owners and was not going to hang around with his Rolleiflex for six months until the kitten and duck decided to play happy families and kissy kissy. Oh dear me, no. So, out with the weights for the legs, the double sided sellotape, and of course, the stapling gun. Et voila! Now you know, and so does the RSPCA. Bygone number four. Skippy the bush kangaroo. Skippy the bush kangaroo. <laughs> What's that you say, Skip? They're robbing the bank of Wallamaloo. What's that you say, Skip? The leader of the gang is a white male Caucasian, age 33, called Ned the Mauler. The television artist Skippy was a celebrated antipodean marsupial specialising in criminal investigation, forensic work and eating eucalyptus trees. And what's that you say, Skip? They've escaped in a big blue van and the registration number is IOU253. Mr Skippy's particular talent, which he shared with... Rin Tin Tin, Black Bob, Flipper the Dolphin, and Lassie, was the ability to convey large amounts of detailed information to humans, despite being able only to gnash his teeth and bounce up and down. Unfortunately for Skippy, one day the bubble burst, because there was one question he could not answer. How long do kangaroos live for? Answer, until about three weeks after their TV series is axed. Bygones part three, the Slinky, the Aztec chocolate bar, Heinz kidney soup, Hairy Face Toy and The Prisoner. <laughs> Bygone Television Commercial of the Week. The Aztec Chocolate Bar Campaign. This is one of the shortest lived advertising campaigns in the history of television. Just as Stalin, Unperson Trotsky, so Cadbury's have unchocolate barred the Aztec. Today Cadbury's proudly present a new bar. The problem was not one of flavour but taste. Unfortunately, the manner in which this commercial continued is unsuitable for broadcast. The bright young advertising executive charged with the campaign decided that Aztec bar should be marketed a la San Peckinpah. 
Give it to and me, love. And include a seven-foot Aztec gentleman scaling a Mexican love pyramid love with his chum, shaking his fist in the air and cutting off the head of an animal in no uncertain oh, manner, while rivers of blood flowed into guttering, forming the words Aztec. Aztec. A feast of a bar. Bygone number two. Heinz kidney soup. Heinz kidney soup. The worldwide marketing of Heinz Kidney Soup must surely rank as the eighth wonder of the modern world. The reason for the demise of this product was simple. The taste was crap, or more appropriately, piss. A perusal of the great culinary tome since time began reveals that kidney soup has never been regarded favourably, whether by Brie Savoyen, Mrs. Beaton, Larousse Gastronomique, or even the great Hudson and Halls. Gourmands and gourmets agree that a braised kidney, redolent with the tang of lamb's urine, is one of the world's great delicacy. But the whole shebang becomes less palatable when bits of kidney are floating in what appears to be a bowl full of bright yellow wee-wee. Would you, for example, consider offering as a first course heart soup or liver soup or cream of offal? No. So why the hell did Heinz ever market the stuff in the first place? We will never know. All that remains is a lingering aftertaste as though someone had piddled in your mouth. Not that I know what that tastes like, goodness me, no. All that stuff about me in the news of the world was... Bygone number three. The Hairy Face Magnetic Toy. The Hairy Face Magnetic Toy. The Hairy Face, also known as the Thousand and One Disguises Game, was a children's toy from the early 1960s, consisting of a piece of card on which was printed a rudimentary hairless face, covered with a plastic screen, and like all high-tech, scientifically advanced toys of the period, this game comprised of nothing more sophisticated than two ounces of iron filings, which could, with the aid of a magnetic pen, be encouraged to align themselves around the alopeciacal features of the face. All results looked either like Clement Freud, or Clement Freud upside down, or his daughter Emma needing a shave. Bygone number four. The Prisoner Television Program. The Prisoner Television Program. The Prisoner Television Program, starring Patrick I'm Stark raving mad Magoog Han, was first screened in 1968 and quickly became cult viewing for the sort of people who didn't have girlfriends, used to be train spotters, and had read Lord of the Rings 65 times. They looked like this. Yes, gormless cretins, who only became fully erect at the sight of an S402 diesel with reversible twin coupling camshafts. Available on Channel 5 Video. The prisoner was watered down Kafka and offered an absurd paranoid vision of a futuristic society, ruthlessly authoritarian, obsessed with secrecy and information where the media was completely controlled by the government, which itself was controlled by a power-crazed dictator. A ridiculous fantasy which, thank God, could never happen today. Oh dear me, no. No chance, how absurd, what a thought, John. <laughs> By far the oddest thing about The Prisoner was that Lou Grade ever allowed the programme to be made in the first place. The audience was confused, the actors were bemused, and the writers hadn't got a clue, least of all about how to end it. Luckily, Mr. Grade knew how to create a satisfactory conclusion. This involved him picking up a telephone and saying, OK, boys, take the bloody thing off. And then he stopped Mr. McGookin having any more money. But Bubble cars, bags of all kinds, Data 70 typeface, and Zoom ice lollies. Bygone number one, the bubble car, the bubble car. A combination of economic factors in the years after World War II led to these ludicrous three-wheeled machines being foisted upon a transport-hungry Britain in the 1950s. Easy to park, easy to be sick in, hard not to laugh at, and making the Reliant Rialto look like a status symbol, the genesis of the bubble car was a miracle of adaptive engineering. Premise number one. Although forbidden by the Allies to invade British airspace after losing the war, the Teutonic spirit for global conquest was undiminished. Premise number two. It came to the attention of Messrs. Heinkel and Messerschmitt that there was a three-year waiting list in Britain for four-wheeled cars. Conclusion. Simply saw the cockpits off old Messerschmitt 109s and Heinkel 110s at three wheels, a 250cc stroke engine and some rubber bands and invade British road space instead. The seating arrangements of these cars stayed the same as their aircraft equivalents. The Heinkel had a large perspex hinge door at the front, with two people sitting side by side. Fortunately, the great majority of the British public refused to take such an absurd design seriously, which is why no present-day manufacturer would waste his time building and marketing a toy car for adults. Oh, goodness me, no. Bygone number three, Data 70 typeface. Data 70 typeface. A Data 70 typeface, when it first appeared in 1967, was modern, like all modern things. 
Ten years later, they look ridiculous as, and deader than, a dodo. Every letter ended with a silly little blob, and wording in this style appeared on terribly modern machinery in films like The Fantastic Voyage or Joe 90, machinery with buttons labelled Interstellar Transmogrificational Cybernoid Unit B or Symbiotic Waltz Generating Warp Drive Thrust Booster. Ridiculous, isn't it? Fortunately, this typeface is long since dead and buried, with the honourable exception of the BBC Television School's Education Department, where it is used by nonagenarian producers who frankly still consider Val Dunican to be an angry young man. Bygone television logo of the week. Bygone number four. Zoom ice lollies. Zoom ice lollies. During the height of the space race in the 1960s, the Zoom rocket-shaped multicoloured ice lolly was a bestseller. Kids would suck on them while watching sentimental news items about dogs being rocketed into space in the name of science. What the kids weren't told was that the animals were not coming back, dear me, no. They were shot off into the cosmos in a spiky little satellite with a few bones, an open microphone, and as much oxygen as you could fit into the modest confines of an interstellar kennel come coffin. Bye-bye, pioneering doggy. Bye-bye, doggy to you, bye-bye. Bygones Part 5, Douglas Bard, total lack of hygiene in butcher shop, the VCS3 synthesizer, the Pekamak, and Emperor Hirohito. Bygone number two. Complete lack of hygiene in butcher shops. Complete lack of... Long time ago, before the boys at the Environmental Health Inspectorate decided they didn't have enough to do, you used to be able to buy food in the most unhygienic conditions imaginable. Some neighbourhoods were so rough that they would sell broken mega plan, into which could be stuck a pin with one and nine written on a crest. Flies could be seen intercoursing the meat, butchers would stick their fingers up their own bum holes, taking them out only to serve customers, pork scratchings were carved from the bits of the big scratches, all wrapped up in a newspaper. Spattered with the expectant mucus, coughed up over it by the original owner, a non consumptive from around the corner. Nowadays, this has all been eradicated, and consequently, Britain is a safer place to eat in. Pity, food doesn't seem to have any taste anymore. Bygone television logo of the week. Bygone number three, uh, the VCS-3 synthesizer. The VCS-3... Th the VCS-3 synthesizer, British through and through and therefore utterly suspect from the very first, was regarded as the last word in musical technology and cost the present day equivalent of three and a quarter million pounds, which was unfortunate because... It could only play one note at a time, and that note was extremely nasty. Its sense of pitch was determined not by any known eastern or western scale, but rather by whether or not it was sunny outside. It was operated by an innovative patchboard system modelled on a GPO telephone exchange from 1932. One assumes that the VCS-3 stood for very crappy synthesizer Mark III, the only decent thing about it being that it was built into a smart and compact attaché case, and was easily transportable to faraway lands, where we assume the inhabitants were all born mercifully and profoundly deaf. Bygone number four. The Packamac. The Packamac. A stylishly waterproof garment made from the finest handwoven nylon polyamide with buttons welded into it, the Packamac was a hideously and grotesquely ugly accoutrement to any hideously and grotesquely ugly person's wardrobe. The sort of person, in fact, who in the 1950s worked in an office in Crawley and took his own lunch in a Tupperware box and kept his Packamac in the very same box because the weather can change just like that. A Packamac wearer was also the sort of person who would own string back driving gloves, kept the plastic factory covers on their car seats in perpetuity, wore string vests, bought prefabricated garden sheds that advertised on the back page of the Radio Times, broke out into a cold sweat if anybody made a long distance phone call that lasted more than 20 seconds, kept tropical fish, switched off the goons, disgusted, and was inevitably called Harold. This stylish garment was much loved by all manner of thoroughly splendid sexual deviants. Packamac fortnight on with all the pomp and seriousness of a Paris fashion show was held on June the 13th to the 25th, 1960. Bygone number five, Emperor Hirohito, Emperor Hirohito. Emperor Hirohito of Japan was not only descended from God, he was also a bit of a dab hand at the understatement. His greatest success in this field was to remark, after slight difficulties at Hiroshima, It would appear that war has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. Spot on, Emperor, it would indeed appear that the war has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. On a brighter note, you may be interested to know that chopsticks are one of the main reasons why the Japanese did not invent custard. Bygone Part 6. How? I Spy Books, The Little White Dot on the Television, and Moonwalking. Bygone. Bygone Number 1. How? How?
How a program which appeared on the electric television throughout the 1960s was unique in that it failed on all counts to fulfill any of the IBA's criteria for children's programming. All children's programming throughout the 1960s must be both educational and entertaining. How was presented by four oddballs. Ow! <laughs> a cub reporter caught Fred Dinich, who, let's face it, has never quite made it. Have you, Fred? No. A Unistubs lookalike caught Marion Davis, who replaced the outsized bunty after she grew too large to fit on the screen. Jack Hargreaves, who has spent the last 30 years pretending to be a rustic nonagenarian and, by the way, was also on the board of directors of Southern Television. <laughs> and a highly embarrassed academic from the University of Southampton, who obviously had come to rue the day he ever met a children's producer from Southern Television. And what the hell am I doing on this programme anyway? Now, if you'll do Napoleon, John, Ooh. I'll do Wellington if you can't see my boots. That's a lovely big ruby you've got there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> You've come out badly there, there Jack. It's absolute stalemate. Oh, right. This happening. is a one. -up. It was a decade of dialogue like this that we believe brought Southern Television to its knees in the 1970s. Bygone number two. Old fashioned I spy books. Old fashioned I spy books. Sixpence from all reasonable news agents, I spy books were loosely based on the eponymous so called boredom beating in car game. Nearly there, children. Ooh, I spy with my little eyes, something beginning with... The idea of these books was to award yourself points for spotting real-life examples of the illustrations contained therein. Once you've completed a volume, you're invited to return it to the Big Chief, who probably spent his time rubbing out the ticks and reselling the books, but who did in turn send a certificate saying, well done, in a mass-produced form letter sort of a way. Premise number one. I spy books typically ask their 11-year-old readers to locate at such everyday items as an original set of Renaissance crumb horns, or a spong ratchet from a 10667 Kinsey model of an early 20th century retrograde seed drill. Premise number two. Scrupulously honest for the first two pages of the book, the reader would soon feel demoralized at the impossibility of finding, for instance, a medieval Byzantine cathedral ogive in their local environs such as Ripple Road, Dagenham. This feeling of betrayal amongst working class children led to cheating on a massive scale. Yes, I've got it. Yes. Yes. Yes, I've got it. Yes. Yes, I've got that. Yes. Yes, I've got that as well. Yes, I've got that. Yes, yes. Conclusion, children frequently lay awake all night pissing themselves and in a cold sweat fear a visit from the big chief high spy who might knock at their bedroom door at any moment demanding to know in which particular Dagenham Street they had seen the internal thrust sprocket from the Sputnik 2. In fact, all that happened was that Big Chief I Spy sent a well-done certificate all the same, leading the nation's youth to conclude that the only site the great man was really interested in was a great pile of two and sixpenny postal orders made payable to Big Chief I Spy. Bygone television logo of the week. Bygone number three. The little white dot. The little white dot. Well, it's 7.30 and you must all go to bed now because this is 1950s and we can't have the working classes staying up late and using up valuable electricity that the toffs need so they can dance the night away. Good night and God bless you all. Ever since the advent of the transistor, TV screens, when switched off, go completely blank. In the 1950s, the picture, as you can see, would condense into a little white dot in the centre of the screen. During rationing, this dot was relished and considered a great delicacy. A succulent morsel and high in protein too, Mum. Unfortunately, vulgar working class kiddies would go scrumping their little white dots in mid-afternoon before they'd been completely ripened by a full day's wholesome programming. And suffer severe tummy ache. And quite right too, they'd been naughty. Yes, they had indeed been naughty. Bygone number four. Moonwalking one and two. Moonwalking number one. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This session of moonwalking giant cost $800 billion, dollars, and the only practical benefit was this. The non-stick saucepan. On the other hand, this session of plastic surgery cost only $8 million, but the only practical benefit was something even more useless. Oh, Several thousand oh, vacuous, oh, imbecilic oh, youths simulating oh, epileptic oh, fits oh, while seemingly oh, travelling up oh, a down oh, escalator. Oh, my God. Sunday on 4. Referred very properly this afternoon to the programme Cathy Come Home. I welcome...